you, you walk through a home show and the window contractor will save you 20% and the HVAC contractor will save you 20% and the insulation contractor will save you 20%. By the time you're done talking to all the contractors, <laughs> your house is net zero just by doing <laughs> some upgrades. Hello, pirates. Welcome back. Here we are, March 30th. It's spring. Spring is in the air. The spring breeze is blowing. Flowers are blooming. Welcome back. Again, I'm Lucas Finko. And together, you and me, we're the pirates of clean tech. Yar! Get your yar out. Arg! Arg, yar, yar. All right. So, to celebrate spring, I wanted to bring up uh, an interview that we did about a month ago with a friend of mine, Cynthia Adams. She's the CEO of uh, Energy Efficiency Startup. Uh, it seemed kind of relevant with spring coming up that we could talk about, you know, upgrades to your home and your HVAC system and your your uh, insulation. So without further ado, let's skip over to the interview with Cynthia Adams. So like we've been saying recently, we do have a podcast on clean tech and we never have any clean tech guests on so in the theme of having real clean tech guests on we have a special treat we have the ceo of pearl certifications cynthia adams on the show she is a real entrepreneur who's running a real startup in the energy efficiency space uh in the residential kind of residential ee space so we're really excited to have her on and have her talk about what uh issues her new startup is tackling so actually that's exactly where i wanted to go cynthia first can you explain to us what pearl certifications is why is it needed why why do we need pearl certifications sure um so uh once upon a time in a galaxy far away uh i used to work in um construction uh i was a green builder and back in the day i can remember telling our clients that um, it's not going to be 14% to build your house sustainably. It's um, a fraction more of the average cost that it would take to build a, a new home in order to build something that could be energy efficient, uh, better indoor air quality, et cetera. And so it was interesting after the market crashed in 2008, and um, I had a couple of career changes <laughs> along the way. Uh, I found myself running energy efficiency and renewable energy programs uh, in the stimulus days. And so we had applied for different grants, had some millions of dollars to work with, and we're focusing on energy efficiency in uh, residential, low-income, multifamily, and commercial buildings. And um, at the time, LEED and Energy Star were uh, seeing a lot of traction, particularly in the commercial building sector. And um, the, the sort of corollary to uh, going over all of the benefits of having an energy efficient property that I recall from my builder days is, and therefore, because your property has all these other benefits, it should be worth more uh, in comparison to other properties that lacked those types of benefits. And indeed in the commercial building sector, you saw that. You saw buildings that were assessing, appraising, renting and selling for more because they had lower operational costs, they had a better working environment, therefore less churn. There were a lot of really good things that came out of those buildings. Yeah. However, when you looked at the residential building sector, uh, you, you didn't see a similar corollary when it came to added value for a property that was more energy efficient um, or uh, back in the you know, 2010, 2012 time, uh, renewable energy was just starting to take off in the resi sector, uh, at least where I was located. And, and you weren't seeing much benefit in terms of home value for that either, even though you may have been spending $20,000, $40,000 in order to upgrade your property. So uh, we were part of different task force and thought leadership groups, we meaning myself and my co-founder partner, Robin LeBaron, which is how we met each other, and got to talking about why, why that was. Why, why is it that you had all of these benefits happening in the commercial building sector, but you weren't seeing it in Resi? And what we, what we believe it came down to was a data problem. You, the, the people who understood the high performing features could speak to the performance indicators and the benefits for that are typically the contractors that would work uh, you know, under the direction of the homeowner. And those contractors were not ever involved in uh, collecting that data and sharing that data back with the homeowner. Uh, they had nothing to do with a future real estate transaction or an appraisal. And so if essentially all of that information about the house was invisible. 
Uh, and in fact, the tagline for Pearl is we make home value visible. And that's really where the certification comes in. It verifies the high performing features of the house. Um, it provides a sort of um, chain of custody, if you will, for the efficacy of that data. And then through our software platform, we're able to take the data and then create outputs in different types of reports that meet the needs of the user. So whether that's a real estate agent, a homeowner, a contractor, uh, et cetera, we can make sure that that information is um, displayed in a way that is congruent with what they need. Um, and then for the consumer, we also can take what would be this sort of ABC alphabet number soup of efficiency data and turn it into um, consumer benefits that resonate with people. So um, for us, the certification is necessary because otherwise you have no way to get quality, what we call investment grade data, uh, sort of out of the mind of the contractor and at, you know, off of the label of the box and into a future you know, transaction, whether it's a refinance or a resale or what have you. All right, okay. So that, that I think was one of the interesting things for me is that uh, your certifications are accepted by appraisers, right? And so they will actually, and that's what lenders use, right? The appraisal. So you're actually contributing to the value of the home, right? Yes, yes. The, yeah. the purpose of the certification is meant to capture this information and then uh, make it available for the appraiser to use when they're creating their opinion of value. Um, I, I wanna be uh, open about the fact that when you have this, this number of market actors sort of involved in the transaction, lenders, appraisers, real estate agents, home inspectors, buyers, home sellers, et cetera, um, you, the idea of market transformation is, is super compelling and it's also really messy. So uh, you have an appraisal institute for example, that provides uh, additional certifications and trainings for appraisers and it's sort of standard setting. Um, and, but at the same time, there's only a fraction of appraisers that actually are members of the Appraisal Institute. It's not like 70% of them, it's, it's a smaller number than that. So there's a lot of, um, your mileage may vary from one appraiser to the next. And uh, I think homeowners, contractors, anybody who works in the energy efficiency space has a horror story of their own to tell or of a friend where you know, they've done all of the right things, they've tried to make all the information available to the appraiser and they've still gotten back an appraisal that doesn't take into account all, you know, these, <laughs> these additional features. Yes. So it's not, it's not an easy problem to solve, um, but we're working on it. Okay, so Cynthia, big picture question here. I mean, everybody talks about clean tech, they talk about renewables and the sexy things like solar and wind. But nobody wants to talk about like HVAC and energy efficiency. Uh, you know, it's just not as sexy. It's totally neglected. So is your company trying to address this issue and, and bring a solution for this? So I'll take your last question first and say, yes, I do think that our company is a solution for that and is, is hopefully catalyzing a lot more energy efficiency improvements um, in the future. Uh, why? But your question is a really good one. Uh, Rocky Mountain Institute uh, issued a, did a survey of a thousand plus consumers nationwide a couple of years back. And in, according to their survey, they found that two thirds of the homeowners desired to have an energy efficient home. Uh, they, but when you look at the number of homeowners who had actually um, made substantive upgrades for energy efficiency, the number was really small by comparison. <laughs> um, so where is the disconnect happening? And um, one of the other interesting things that that RMI study said that we have found to be true in our own business is that people typically aren't thinking about energy efficiency unless they have a problem that brings it to mind. So that could be a high bill complaint. It could be a comfort issue in the house. Uh, it could be that a person in the house has some kind of a health condition that's affected by indoor air quality, which ties back to ventilation and humidity and other things that are related to energy efficiency. And so you have what are these trigger events where people are open to learning more about energy efficiency and actually acting, choosing differently in their purchasing habits because of that information. So the, the problem that you then have is how do you provide the consumer with the right kind of information at the right time so that they can make a decision that's really in their best interest. Um, and I, that, that's really where typically the, 
you know, you may have friends and family who share information with you, but you also rely on the contractor who shows up to your door to solve the problem that you've called them in for. And uh, probably all of us can share a contracting story that didn't end well. So the, the level of trust for contractors is probably about on par as with lawyers and used car salespeople. Uh, it's, not, it's not high. So how does a homeowner know if they're being sold something that's good for them or just, you know, kind of a bill of goods, because frequently you can, I've heard this from people, you you walk through a home show and the window contractor will save you 20% and the HVAC contractor will save you 20% and the insulation contractor will save you 20%. By the time you're done talking to all the contractors, (laughs) your house is net zero just by doing (laughs) some upgrades. So it's really hard to, to, you know, I think as a consumer to judge um, what's, what's true uh, and and more, even more importantly, what's what's true for my house, and and then also you know for my budget. So again, the certification system that we've developed is uh, meant to be transparent, meaning it's asset based. Uh, we assign points. The more efficient a thing is to the house, the more it contributes to um, to, to comfort and indoor air quality and other things. The more points it earns. So it's not energy modeling. It's not like a black box and. With that in mind, we can give consumers some really explicit advice about um, what they might invest in in order to uh, lower energy bills, increase comfort, improve the value of their home, et cetera. And then um, we deliver our certification through what we think of as an elite contractor network. We have a vetting process in place to credential the contractors to participate in Pearl's network. And it's not a pay to play. I mean, we contractors do pay us money in order to certify their work, but just because you pay us money doesn't get you into the network. Mm -hmm. And and so our our way of trying to address some of these problems is first of all, help the consumers understand when they're working with a quality contractor. So it's not just, does the contract show up on time, wear their booties and make jokes with you. It's (laughs) what is the quality of their service? What is the quality of their install? What is their long-term commitment to you as a customer? And you need these things in order to be in our network. So let's help contractors that are really high quality stand out from what we think of as the two chucks in a truck in in the industry who are less Mm -hmm. quality, but they have a low bid. And and then through a transparent certification system, help provide homeowners with actionable information that works with their budget, works with them over time so that they can continue to make good decisions. Um, Right, so along those lines, if I... I mean, if I pick a random contractor out of the phone book, I mean, how much does the average contractor know about things like energy efficiency and payback periods and, and things like that? Like, you know, and how do they, you know, how do you get through all that? How do (laughs) do you help the contractors with you? So I I think it depends on the contractor. There's so much variability in the contracting space. Hmm. On the one hand, you have like, NASA level engineers who are doing (laughs) energy audits with all kinds of modeling and they're like modeling out three different packages with all (laughs) the projected energy savings and you know they they literally take into account you know the appliances the lighting you know not just the major systems in the house Mm -hmm. and then on the other hand you have um, the companies that have been at this since their father's father uh, and they're all about the box replacement and federal minimum standard will do. So, you know, that's, yeah. that's a pretty wide range of knowledge around efficiency. Typically contractors, um, the good ones understand that the house is a system and that uh, the different systems interact, the building shell interacts with the HVAC and vice versa, and will try to educate the consumer. And oftentimes our houses are so, ones that haven't been built, say post-modern energy code, have so many problems with them that the consumer may call the contractor in for one thing, but you know the contractor, after investigating, you know may come back to the consumer. We'll actually need three things. You know we need to reconfigure your ducts. We need to do some some duct sealing, and then we need to replace the unit as as an example. So, um, I think contractors are challenged to try to explain to homeowners the the building science and the financing program and the unit they want to install and what the competitor said. And it, right. it can become a really, really tricky conversation. Um, 
But to answer your question, you know, I, I think by and large, the majority of contractors have a sense of building science. They may or may, they, but they have a varying levels as to how much that informs their sales and, um, and their engagement with the homeowner. Okay. Well, I could ask the same question about the homeowners, right? I mean, how much does your average homeowner understand about energy efficiency? And I mean, you kind of already asked, answered this question. They, they all want it, but they like, I don't know, do they not know what to do or they did not know how to do it or what, is, what is that barrier? Why is 1%, you know, actually executing energy efficiency upgrades on their home when 60% want it? Uh, what's, what's the barrier? Um, that's a great question. So, I mean, when I talk to homeowners, uh, you, you may have experienced this if you talk to homeowners, when I bring up energy efficiency, I, I'll tell you the first thing that they typically talk about is LED lighting, solar and windows. Mm, so yeah. that's, you know, mm. LED lighting because it's kind of hot and now and um, solar is not energy efficiency, it's actually producing energy, but it, it's its own, has its own sexy. Uh, and then windows, I don't know, um, man, they're just really successful with their commercials, those, those window <laughs> manufacturers. So it's, it's like, and, and then Energy Star. I mean, it, definitely Energy Star is like uh, one of the most recognizable brands in the US, like right up there with the American Heart Association. And, um, and, but typically consumers are associating Energy Star with white goods, right? Like is Energy Star refrigerator, Energy Star dishwasher. Uh, they don't think as much about Energy Star you know, say on their HVAC unit, and there's no such thing as energy star for your building shell. And building shell, of course, is a really important component of, of um, heating yeah. and cooling efficiency. So um, they, they, ha they don't have a, a true education around energy efficiency. I don't know that it's reasonable to expect them to, but I do think that there are um, other folks like real estate agents who could set them on the right path at critical moments. And then, of course, there are contractors who can take the time to kind of explain some things to them. But it's it's uh, people are busy, and um, <laughs> if you know energy efficiency, if it doesn't, if it's not causing them a problem in their life, is is usually not rising to the fore as something that I really need to know about. You know, compared to all the other things that are jockeying for people's attention. So, Cynthia, you're you're not just selling the greening of the home. Then you're also providing some sort of a uh, Angie's List type of service, right? Where people will feel assured that they're getting the value for their EE upgrades. I mean, we've been talking on the podcast about how individuals can actually take action and have impact uh, on climate change. So this this kind of allows people to take steps in areas that they have power over so they can adjust climate change themselves. Yeah, absolutely. Well, a couple of things about our approach that uh, we think is unique and innovative. Uh, if you look at the scores, certifications and labels that are out there now, most of them have been developed for new construction because it's a lot easier to start with a clean slate and tell, give someone directions on how to make a good house than it is to take a house that was built in the 1920s or the 1960s or the 1980s and, and make that energy efficient. It, it, gets, it gets to be more complicated. So what we've done is our, our system is meant to work with the homeowner over time. And we not only have a certification software that contractors use, but we have a consumer facing portal called Green Door that a homeowner can go in. And if they've been working with a Pearl Network contractor, then their home's record is already pre-populated with the data from that, from that installation. And Pearl certification can make recommendations for them on future improvements to make and create what we call a home investment plan. So as the homeowner, you know, as things wear out or they save up some money or, you know, they're going to have an addition to the family, they need an addition to the house, we can work with them over time, which is more how people think about their homes. They don't typically think I'm going to go out tomorrow and do a $50,000, you know, deep energy upgrade. Um, that, that's, it is some of us, but it's not most of us. Right. So uh, I think that the ability to treat the home's profile like a living record and then allowing the, the homeowner to engage with us over time and, and work with them to update their home's profile is, is a powerful thing in, in guiding them and keeping them engaged. And particularly around the messaging that for most people, their home is their most important financial asset. And many people are building equity in that because they expect to cash out at some point, whether it's to buy another property or downsize and retire or what have you. And if you can get, you know, 
5%, 7% more for your house, have it cost less to own and operate, be more comfortable with better under air quality. Well, that's a pretty darn good investment all the way around. And so, you know, helping people think of their home that way and understand, okay, these are real practical things that you can do over the course of home ownership to meaningfully improve the return on investment that you have in your property. I, I think it's, it resonates to your point. Uh, a lot of people struggle with, you know, what can I do about climate change? They, they're not involved in the decision to, to build a coal plant. They're not involved in the decision to build a nuclear plant. They're not involved in decisions to, you know, but they are involved in what goes on in their house, right? Mm -hmm. You can make a decision not to burn fossil fuels in your home um, and you can go electrification and then you just have to, you know, rely on the, the grid getting more clean, but you can make those choices, you know, that you don't, I don't want to burn fossil fuels in my home, right? And that's something you can do right now. So I really like that yeah. message. We, we do have a lot of uh, younger uh, professional listeners. So I'm wondering if you could talk a little bit about your career and kind of maybe a lesson or two that you've learned that made you super successful in your career. <laughs> <laughs> um, sure. Uh, so I guess what I would say about my career is that um, it's like a lot of entrepreneurs in that I've had multiple careers. I think if there's one thing that I've, I've noticed with entrepreneurs is we tend to have a love of learning and are willing to kind of jump into something that might feel riskier for, for others. And so as a result, I guess I would say that I've, I've done I've done a lot of different things over the course of my career, but they've all seemed to kind of build from one to the other. Um, the, the stint through the construction landscape actually started when my husband and I renovated a 1770s uh, brick farmhouse in, uh, outside of Lexington, Virginia. Wow. And we learned about indoor air quality that way because there was lead-based paint um, wow. on the walls and we had mold and mildew issues and uh, a son that was, had, um, was sensitive to that. Mm. And um, so kind of going through that process taught us a lot about the quality of a house and um, why you would wanna renovate a house that was that old as opposed to tearing it down because of the quality of the materials and, and the character of the home. And you, you contrasting that to the McMansions that were being built new around, uh, it was it was a it was a learning process for us that was deeply personal. And then, um, the more that we kind of took to it, we decided to then create our own green building construction company. And this was launching for us uh, right at the end of the 1990s and into the 2000s when we had this incredible housing boom. And um, there were a lot of um, lessons learned there around the the importance of having a really high quality product. Uh, the houses that we built, we would bring architects and interior designers and others through and just talk to them about the mortise and tenon joinery that we did here. And um, we were one of the first ones to use spray foam insulation in attics and insulated concrete forms and mm. other sorts of things. And that effort that we took, first of all, to not um, skimp on the quality and then to um, actively engage the, the different um, audience, stake members, potential customers, et cetera, really went a long way to launching our business um, at, at that time. And Stone Metal Wood was really successful and, until the market crashed and then suddenly nobody was successful. But I, I think, so that's a, a lesson learned, I would say, like to um, make sure that what you're doing is, is quality, like don't make crappy things. <laughs> and then <laughs> And then be able to articulate what is quality about the thing that you are making. I mean, the, the joy and beauty of being an entrepreneur is that you're making something out of nothing. Like literally that thing right. didn't exist before. And right. construction was sort of a, a primer for that. The, the, when the market did crash though, I ended up um, initially taking a job with the city of Charlottesville working as the climate protection program coordinator. And one of the first things that landed in my lap was a grant opportunity to stand up a nonprofit that would work in public private partnership with local mm -hmm. state and federal government to run energy efficiency and renewable energy programs. And so yeah. when we won that grant, I applied to, to run the nonprofit, um, got the job and then, and then built it out to a couple of locations and 20 some employees. And along the way, I also founded the Virginia Energy Efficiency Council. So I'm not telling you all this just to toot my horn. What I'm telling <laughs> you all of this for is to say that I had, um, at times a lack of confidence 
in, in getting into this because I was, it was getting deeper and deeper into the energy space. I didn't have formal education in that. I had a lot of practical education through doing construction and other things. I was a lead mm -hmm. AP at the time. So, um, hmm. but, but what I found is when you're, when you're pushing the envelope on doing something new, more often than not, people are willing to get out of your way to let you fail because they think that that's more likely than you actually succeeding. <laughs> and so I was amazed at like how far I could just keep going. I'm going to push for this thing and I'm going to try to get this meeting and then I'm going to say, we need this <laughs> legislation. And, and not everything happened at once, but people right. were like, well, okay, let her try. See what happens. <laughs> right. And that was sort of an interesting thing. So the moral of this story is don't let your fear or your lack of confidence hold you back. It's okay to, to say yes and then figure out how to do it as you go. Uh, yeah. because if you're, if you're going after the right thing, people will climb on board with you and they'll help make that vision a reality. Oh man. It's really good to hear you talk about if you're going to do it, do it with quality, right? I feel like some people think it's okay maybe to take some shortcuts as long as you get to where you want to be. But in the long run, uh, I've found that that really kind of bites you that, if you really put the hard work and the perseverance into everything that you do, it really pays off in the long run. People, people see what you're doing. People see how you work. You build a reputation. I mean, even if there's a little short-term suffering, that's really the right way to go in the long run. Thank you. Thank you. Um, yeah, I, I believe in, um, I believe in integrity and uh, mm -hmm. people respond to that and recognize it in, in the work that we do, not just in the people that we are, but the way in which that manifests in the things that we do as well. So Cynthia, where can our listeners go to get more information on Pearl certifications? Sure, you can go to our website at pearlcertification.com and uh, you can find Green Door there as well, but uh, another way to find Green Door would be greendoor.app uh, online and uh, homeowners can sign up for that whether they work with a parole contractor or not so it's it's not a requirement that you work with a parole contractor to avail yourself of the benefits in green door yeah yeah i was just on there today i finally got on there to see my home in there and well it was almost overwhelming there's so much information on there i need like another couple of hours just to go through it and see all that stuff um and totally engage with with green door so i'm um, so far i'm really impressed um <laughs> oh good <laughs> Obviously, I love the idea of pro contractors, so um, I'm really happy to see you very successful. And I do have to disclose uh, as a regulation FD that I am an investor in pro certifications, so um, I'm slightly biased there too. But I, I'm only an investor because I believe in what you guys are doing, and I think it's really important. I think you're in the right spot. And I think I, I hope that you get a lot of traction because you can get a lot of carbon uh, impact from what you're doing. Absolutely. Um, it's why we're here. Wow, this was this was a great conversation. I think it'll really provide a lot of value to our listeners. Thank you again for coming up. Thank you. Well, I very much appreciate the opportunity. And uh, yeah, I, I, I wish you all the best. And I, I hope I get another option to come back and tell you about all the great progress we've made a year from now. Yeah, thanks, Cynthia. Okay, Pirates, I hope you enjoyed that interview with Cynthia Adams. I know she was great. We really hope Pearl Certifications uh, does really well. And I hope you're able to get on her tool and check out your home or your building and to see how you rank up, uh, see how you stack up on there, see what your point score is. <laughs> and... Uh, and, and find some things that you could do on there to help improve the energy efficiency of, of your abode and make a real impact on climate change. So I really like that interview. I really like Pearl a lot. So it was really, really interesting to have her. All right, I'm going to talk about a couple of news articles with you guys. So let's skip over to that. All right, here we go. Uh, I'm going to start with this one from... The the Energy and Policy Institute, it's energyandpolicy.org. Uh, this is from March 23rd from Joe Smith and David Palmer. Let's thank, thank them for this. Uh, they have uh, quite a critical article here. Major investors find electric utilities are not on track to meet their decarbonization goals. So this was a little upsetting for me to read 
uh, you know, a lot of U.S. utilities have announced kind of net zero or decarbonization goals, a lot of them like way off in the future. And it, it sort of almost feels like sometimes they do that just because it's so far in the future, they don't have to do much right now, right? So it, it doesn't feel real, you know, ah, 2060, I'm sure we'll be fine. Um, I don't have to change anything for 2022. Uh, and so this group of investors decided to dig into it and look, and what they found was not good. So they took, here's, here's this uh, table they've provided, which is really nice. So they took nine items that they looked at for these publicly traded utilities um, or large utilities. So AEPs in here, Berkshire Hathaway is the parent of uh, Berkshire Hathaway Energy. So maybe they don't break their energy uh, numbers apart. You know, and all the big ones are in here, Duke, Dominion, Exelon, Nextera, Energy, PPL. You know, it's Southern Company, we, we all know these, Excel Energy. And they rank them by these these nine categories to see uh, where they're at. So long-term greenhouse gas reduction targets. Oh, only two? Only two of these companies? Really? I mean, I don't know what they mean by partial here. You know, net zero greenhouse gas emissions by, by 2050. One, two, three, four of these have firm targets. You know, another five of partial. I don't know what they mean by partial here. Look at, and, and this is kind of what I was talking about. Almost none of them have some kind of medium term target, at least not a firm one. And very few have a short term target, only three. Uh, and then only four have a decarbonization strategy. And these don't necessarily overlap. Look, I don't, I don't see a company with yeses all across, you know, the, the table. And it looks capital allocation alignment. Um, they're all no's, which is terrible here. WBC Energy has a partial capital allocation alignment, so that's interesting. Uh, TF, uh, TCFD, that's a um, some sort of uh, conference on financial disclosures that uh, ESG people use. Uh, they didn't do too well on that either. Also, climate governance and climate policy engagement also lacking in this area. So. Uh, you know, I've I've had a lot of issues with kind of these net zero goals, as we've talked about in the past, like with credits and with the whole concept of net, you know, as it's currently used as kind of an accounting mechanism and not not the net in the sense you would think of, oh, they're going to do CCS to offset the carbon emissions. No, 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 that's not what they're doing yet. They're just using credits to offset uh, so that they can continue to have emissions. And so, yeah, well, utilities have a ways to go. If if you're at a utility or if you know somebody at a utility, you might want to bring this up with them. Uh, there's a link in here to the report. It's called The Dirty Truth About Utility Climate Pledges. <laughs> this is from January. Uh, it's a very good report. It has a lot of interesting um, information in here. Look at actually, there's some good news in here. Look at the carbon dioxide emissions for electricity has actually declined quite a bit over the last 15 years. So there are some successes here. I'm not trying to poo-poo the utility industry. I know they have a tough job. You know, people still want the lights to come on 24-7. Uh, they want high reliability and they want a low bill. And then they want clean energy on top of that. So it's kind of like the kitchen sink. And I feel for them. But yeah, this... We got to move, uh, you know, I'm happy that we have net zero by 2050 goals. I'm very happy. But now we have to actually do something. We have to make them make them happen. So, yeah, so if you're interested, um, look into this report. Oh, yeah, and here's the TCFD. So that stands for Task Force on Climate-Related Financial Disclosures. It's a framework designed to improve the clarity, consistency, and reliability of climate-related disclosures. I'll put all this in the description below so you can reach this uh, with these pages too. So I thought this was uh, interesting, something that we're going to follow, and we're going to keep talking to utilities about, about those findings. Uh, next, I wanted to bring this up. I have to have a utility dive article because, uh, I don't know, I always have a utility dive article. FERC opened revisiting Mopar 
as grid operators, utilities, mold, future of wholesale markets. So I, I had to bring this I had to bring this up because we had Neil on and I asked him about Mopar and uh, you know, we know it's going to be an issue that's going to come back. And, you know, if you listen to the show, you shouldn't be surprised by this. And Neil actually said that he voted for the previous Mopar orders, but he's not wedded to anything he did in the past. And he's willing to look forward and, and move forward. So if you don't know, Mopar is essentially, it's the minimum offer price rule. It's basically a floor that generators want put in the market because we've seen zero prices for energy. We've seen negative prices for energy and those prices are just not good for anyone. And especially if you're a generator burning fuel, it just doesn't work. So, so generators burning fuel want a floor put in the markets. Um, you know, and, and that <laughs> it may be a solution. It may not be a solution. I mean, we can argue about it all, all day, but, uh, you know, there's an issue of renewable generators don't have these variable costs. They don't have fuel costs. They don't have a lot of operating costs. They don't need an operator. They don't have an operating room. They, you know, they don't have fuel. So they bid zero on the energy markets and it kind of messes with prices, especially when there's a lot of renewables. You know, I like a day like today where there's wind and sun and loads are low because nobody's running the air conditioner. Um you know, you can you can have zero load on the grid like we saw in California. So it's interesting to see what's going to happen here. You know, you heard me give Neil my opinion, which was don't even have renewables bid into the market. Just take them and let the market figure out the net, which I still think is a good idea. So I'd like to see what they're thinking. I think they mentioned that they want carbon pricing in here. I don't think that's the way <laughs> generators are trying to go. I don't <laughs> that's going to artificially increase their price while not changing anything about renewables. So that would be the opposite of um, of what they're trying to get here. And they also talk about, you know, if you if you force Mopar in, places like New Jersey are just going to walk away from from the RTO, and they're you know they're not they're going to take the ball and they're not going to play with with FERC and their rules. Um, and so as long as they, you know, draw a line at the state border, they can have their own rules. Um, they're not interstate anymore. So keeping a close eye on this, I think if you're in clean energy and you have anything to do with clean energy or the grid or anything, you need to keep a close eye on this and you care about, uh, you know, clean energy, you need to keep a clean eye on this, uh, uh, keep an eye on this because it'll have a big impact on whether renewables are getting a fair shake, whether existing grid operators are getting a fair shake, uh, and how our grid is going to evolve over the next 10 to 20 years, which is that time frame where we saw utilities aren't necessarily planning for yet. So it'll be interesting uh, to watch this. Keep an eye on Mopar. Uh, it's, it's a thing. Finally... I mean, you guys already know, I don't like to talk politics on the show, but I <laughs> love bringing politics up when it shows that this is a bipartisan issue, that Republicans and Democrats are both pro-environment, pro-clean energy, pro-clean energy jobs. They're both pro-clean energy. And so here's another example of that. Key Republican signal support for augmenting electric vehicle infrastructure Yay. This is from The Hill by Rachel Frazen from 325. This is Senator Shelley Moore Capito from West Virginia, who's a key Republican on infrastructure issues. You know anything about infrastructure going on nowadays? You know about the Republicans and the Democrats in the Senate? Okay, so this is great. I love to see this. Everybody is pro EVs, Republicans and Democrats. Everybody is pro clean energy. Uh, it's it's a bipartisan issue. Uh, yeah, so that's why I really feel like we we don't need to talk about Washington that much. If you wanna <laughs> if you wanna learn about what's going on in DC, you can watch Political Climate uh, or listen to their podcast. 
Uh, so again, the clean energy is a bipartisan issue. Thank you, Senator Capito from West Virginia for, for making that case for me. All right, so that's all the news that's fit to print here in uh, the end of March. It's been a great run. We're having a good time. We're going to have some good guests for you, hopefully coming up soon. Um, there should be some really interesting guests that we're totally going to geek out with. We're going to get super geeky. It's going to be a lot of fun, and we'll see some interesting future ideas about how to change the grid and maybe some new ideas that we haven't heard of yet. I don't know. It could, could get interesting. I'm looking forward to it. So I'll see you next week. Have a good week and keep fighting pirates. Stay out there and keep fighting the good fight. We'll see you soon. We <laughs> Yar! Arg! Get arg in.